let's start with a quick introduction uh, for what it is that we're actually going to be looking at over the next 30 minutes. In brief, first, a general introduction uh, about DOOR and the speakers. Our president, Elisa Di Giorgio, who you'll see there in the speaker corner, uh, will be taking us through that. And then with uh, the world-renowned speaker and author, John Stoker, will help us understand what his model, Real Talk, is about, why it's important, how it came about. And then we'll look at how this model framework that's been developed can be used to develop conversational kung fu. What, what is that term? And, and why is it important for us to use it? And then finally, we'll wrap up and have a Q&A to see if we stimulated any questions within you. So without further ado, Elisa, can you take us through a little bit about who we are at DOOR International? Thank you, Sebastian. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to have you here. Um, just a little few words about DOOR International, DOOR Training and Consulting. We are a global training and consulting company operating for 40 plus years in the market and actually started originally in the Netherlands. We are now delivering in over 100 countries worldwide and in almost 40 languages, any leadership solution that you can imagine or dream of, sales training, talent development, cultural transformation and accountability, and of course, partnering since 2014 with our fantastic um, co-speaker and also host, uh, John Stoker. Thank you very much. Today's speakers, um, just to wrap that up, you will have the pleasure to get to meet not only Sebastian, who's just there uh, on the right-hand corner of my screen at least, but also, as I mentioned, John Stoker, an international speaker and communications authority who has developed um, several amazing and unique models, and he's going to introduce just one of it today to all of us. And just quickly, Sebastian, who's also joined the organization in 2014. You see, this is our number, 2014, John Soker, 2014, Sebastian. Fantastic team. Thank you very much. Now, how many times, and maybe I should step back here a little bit. I can assume that some of you have children or nieces, nephews, grandchildren. How many times have I said certain words or how many times have I said this to you? At least I have a son. I can't repeat how often I have to say this to my son in a week or sometimes even several times per day. So if you have similar experiences um, or if you have noticed or heard yourself saying that, I think you you get to learn something today. And John, maybe um, how often or how do you hear about this in an organization? How How is it that you come across this particular question um, in your day-to-day -day work with organizations and multinational or global companies? Unfortunately, I think it happens every day where we hold a conversation to address an issue and we think we've handled it and then nothing happens. Or at least we don't get the results that we thought we should have. Um, in reality, that's what uh, kind of came up for me as the notion of fake talk, because you'd think the notion of talking, of conversing, um, particularly if there's been a challenge of some kind or another, and you go to hold that conversation and you do, it's pretty, I think, realistic for us to kind of walk away and go, oh, wow, I'm glad I handled that only two weeks later than what? Nothing has changed, which tells you that you've engaged in, in fake talk. And that's kind of where I started thinking about, why, wow, man, are, are, are we all fake talkers? Uh, so what is it that we ought to be doing where we connect with a person, we establish that rapport, and there's deep understanding about what it is that we're wanting and what it is that we want a person to do or what we want them to change and they get it and they do it uh, and then we're just exactly surprised and delighted with what the outcome has been so um, i think it happens more often at home or at work than we realize we thank stopped you. to think of it thank you john so and sebastian back to yes. you Thank you, Lisa and, and John, for starting off that conversation. For you that are in your home offices or in your actual office, 
take a moment to consider what does this sound like when you are verbalizing it uh, in the office or at home? Is it, do I need to say this again? Will I need to repeat myself? Do we, uh, John brought up a great topic. That's the, the part of the title of his book, Overcoming Fake Talk. And really getting to grips to becoming effortless in our ability to hold meaningful conversations that bring some sort of result. If anyone has an example, feel free to write it down in the chat. Uh, what are some of the topics that come up, when, John, when we are engaging organizations and supporting them to overcome fake talk? What is some of the fake talk that happens within companies? I think one of the most frequent ones we encounter is where we give somebody direction and we think we've been clear and then we don't get what we want. But, um, well, the examples are myriad. I mean, sometimes the salespeople don't talk to the production people, so they sell more than actually can be produced. Sometimes, um, what well, we expect something to be done by a certain date only to have our expectations violated. Like I needed that report this morning at eight o'clock and here it is nine and I still don't have it. Sometimes it's just all kinds of little things. Sometimes it can be some really huge things that may happen. What does the audience think? Has anybody written anything? Yet? Yeah, well, Ricky's mentioned that repeating uh, ourselves can be frustrating. And, and I think one, one example you mentioned that hits, uh, comes close to home is this idea of, of salespeople overselling and having this uh, level of, of saying yes to a potential client while the product isn't quite there yet. And, and it, it changes, it challenges our timelines, our scopes, uh, resources. And by all means, this uh, aspect, which you mentioned in terms of deadlines, is something Mariana has also mentioned and echoed that this happens uh, repeatedly. And so let me ask, thank you for everyone's participation so far and the wonderful introduction, Elisa. Let's continue this conversation and, and go a little bit deeper and say, what would you like to make effortless? What would you like to be effortless in? Take a moment to consider this in the chat, because by all means, if we can do things like we see this uh, woman in the image here, being able to balance her weight, her concentration, her focus. So it almost seems like she's levitating. What would we like to be able to do with so much ease as the person we see here uh, in the image? Yeah, Ricky, thank you for your participation, saying speeding up and understanding, the ability to understand and, and reach uh, closure, perhaps. With, uh, with either our colleagues or people outside of our organizations uh, or even perhaps our spouse and children, like Elisa alluded to. What are some things that we would like to make effortless? Well, here's the real follow-up question. What, and so Patrick, thank you uh, from, from France, active listening. And Tobias coming in saying there's need for clear, accurate, and concise communication, especially when delegating and giving instructions. Wonderful. And then Mariana is essentially echoing this communication importance is so that we don't need to go over every process every time. And so let me ask the next question. What plans do we make, do we commit to, so that we are able to become effortless in these things. And right here, we have some great examples of communication. And I like to shift our perspective towards the difference between talent and potential. Every member of our team, every human on the planet, we'd argue, has potential to achieve what they'd like to achieve. Now, the importance, the, the difference between having that potential and developing the talent so we can actually manifest that potential are two very different things. What we see here in the image is a group of capoeira practitioners. Capoeira is a martial art developed in Brazil, which involves dance and some sort of pseudo combat. Now, when talking about conversational Kung Fu 
and martial arts even, one of the core elements I like to bring to our attention is the importance of reflex, response, muscle memory. Each martial art has a different form of muscle memory they like practitioners to develop. This is so that we can be as safe as possible in a different circumstance, or we be engaging effectively with other practitioner of that martial art. What I'd like to share with us is a wonderful technique developed by John Stoker called Real Talk and the Real Conversational Framework. This is where our potential and our desire to become to be effortless in conversation, uh, when negotiating or delegating, etc., when we can create that into a talent by going through this framework. John, can you take us through what real talk is all about? Well, when I was first thinking about what would we do that would make this process, like you were talking martial art, a process that would actually work, I spent time thinking about not only the skills that people needed to have, but at the same time, what would the process be for holding any difficult conversation? Um, I just felt like if I knew a process or had a process that was internalized, that was easy for me to use, I could apply it to any kind of a conversation, whether it was sharing my vision or sharing expectations or giving feedback or or coaching or resolving conflict or talking about disengagement. And so I came up with this four-step process that you can see on the slide there to the right. Initiate, discover, connect, and build. What's so great about this process is you can apply it to any conversation that you need to hold. And so the initiation part is about how do you start the conversation? So I want to focus the listening of my listener and know how to start. Then I might move to discovery. And discovery is doing nothing more than asking questions to make sure that I've understood rather than assuming that I think I know what I know. Connection, after asking a myriad of questions, is nothing more than the process of summarizing what I think I've heard. But in that process, you can not only summarize, but you can also establish what your expectations are moving forward and be sure that the person understands the consequences of non-performance. Not necessarily the consequences to them, but the consequences to the process or the consequences to the potential client. And finally, building is about creating accountability, coming up with a plan and gaining commitment to that plan. And so in doing so, um, the thing that's great about this process, one, it's simple, there's four steps to it. You always know where you are in the conversation and you always know when you're done. So once you've internalized this process, you can apply it to those difficult conversations that you need to hold. Does that make sense, everyone? Well, you know, it's a good question, John, and thank you for taking us through the, the four steps there. Because one question I would have, and I've, I've engaged with when working with individuals and groups with this content, is what happens when things go off the rails? And, and it sure would be great if we can always initiate, discover, connect, and build. But what elements, what happens, and what can we do with this model when we seem to have deviated from the actual purpose? When does that happen, and what can we do about it? Um, gosh, it could happen at any stage of the conversation. That's what makes the model so important. So let's say you go in to talk about a certain situation, and they change the topic. So you have to know, notice when that happens. So you could say, let's say, for example, that I wanted to talk about somebody being late for work. Let's say they've been late every day for the last two weeks. So I might say, hey, I'd love to talk a little bit about how things are going. Could we visit? It's what we call an attention check. Um, and you go, they go, sure, what's up? And then you share the facts and your interpretation. You know, and so in looking at our time cards, 
Um, I've noticed that you've been anywhere from five minutes to 30 minutes late every day for the last two weeks. And I'm thinking there's something going on that I'm not aware of. So that's the initiation part, me sharing my interpretation. Then I might ask, so help me understand what's going on. And let's say at that second, just at that second, they, they change the topic. So they might say, well, you know, some of the things I have to do, if you'd, if you'd be more clear, then I probably could have got them to you on time. So notice, I'm there to talk about what's going on with that, around tardiness or being timely. And they just turned around and blamed me for a lack of clarity on the assignments I've been giving. Now, most people that don't have a process would take the bait and go, what? I uh, might even respond defensively. Or if I said, gosh, we can talk about clarity in a moment. I want to go back to the tardiness thing, if we could, for a moment. I ask a question about something maybe going on I'm not aware of. Tell me what's happening. Uh, and so I revert back to my initial conversation. And I might take the time to ask all kinds of questions. You know, so let's say I find out that at home, um, this individual has, has a number of children and they've just all had the flu and, and the spouse has had the flu also. And so they've been there to kind of pick up the ball and do some things. And so I might ask things like, you know, how long has this been going on? Is this something that's, that seems to happen regularly? Yes, no. Um, is, is, how are things going? Are, are you, have you taken them to the doctor? What do you think the, you know, the impact has been on us at the business? Were you not being here on time? So I ask whatever questions I want to kind of figure out what's going on. And then I do nothing more in this case by kind of summarizing to connect. So this is not a long-term thing. People are starting to get better, but that's why you've been, been late to work. Am I, am I understanding that correctly? Anything I've missed? No. So immediately then I'd go to build. So what are we gonna do going forward or what are you gonna do to make sure that you're at work on time? And so maybe they just promise you, I'll be at to work on time starting tomorrow on time. Okay, so I can plan, I can plan on that. That's what you'll do, yes. All right, I have your commitment, great. Um, and that's the, you know, the plan, they've just agreed to it. And then we've committed them to the plan and you're done. And then we get to find out tomorrow whether or not we've engaged in real talk or, or again, if we're fake talking. Does that make sense, Sebastian? Certainly. And thank you for taking us through the framework. Uh, I wanted to show it to the group so that you see that this each part of the methodology has a specific process that we would need to practice because John as a master and the designer architect of this framework can just do it off the cuff. But there are nuances in initiation. How do you describe a situation objectively and effectively? How is it that what are the best questions to ask? And so in this scenario that John gave us, we had an example, but each scenario also has its nuances, its questions, its uh, initiation attention checks that we would need to consider. And then, of course, as John masterfully did, how do we respectfully connect it back to what we want to achieve? And so what we often encounter is, is hearing this comment of, well, Seb, John, you know, I don't have the time to practice and plan out every one of my conversations because here you're asking me to map out the conversation. And, and what is something that we often say to individuals, say, we don't have time to plan out every conversation. John, what, what, what is it that you'd recommend to them? I, I would just say, if I had that argument, somebody gave me that, I would say, you're right, you know, engaging in real talk or do what we call dialogue uh, does take time, but the consequences take longer. And so just thinking for a moment, about how many times maybe perhaps you've held a certain conversation because the person hasn't understood um, 
when we lose our effectiveness in whatever we're doing, that takes time and it also costs us money and it impacts the morale or the culture of the way people work together when no one could, when no one can count on anyone else. So um, you don't have to use the model in every conversation, but having a model or a process for holding what oftentimes are difficult conversations. And for me, difficult conversations, are those conversations that we want to avoid like the plague. So we don't hold them. Or if we go to a, hold them and we attempt it, then we don't hold them well. Uh, and things kind of blow up on us. So each individual has to decide, is this conversation important enough that I take a moment to reflect and think about what it is that I want? as an outcome and do some kind of, if you want mental preparation for just holding the conversation. If it's that kind of conversation, then it's well worth it. And the more you do it, the more you practice it, the more you prepare it, the easier it becomes to do it on the fly. Um, like anything else, just like you were talking about with, with your martial artist analogy, it just becomes second nature. So, you know, I would not avoid it. You can avoid it, to be honest. There's just so many conversations we need to hold and hold well. We're going to be effective as leaders and managers and even as individuals. It, it's, it's an excellent framework in the sense that we can apply it to any scenario. By all means, performance evaluations that have to do with tardiness is one thing. We talked about sales. In effect, even negotiations for a promotion, for a raise, a relocation can also be applicable here. And I remember coaching an individual that was going to have a hard conversation with the school teacher of their child. And they said, you know, I want to apply this model to that conversation I've been repeatedly avoiding, or we just don't get past a certain phase. Because by all means, I could imagine getting all the way to connect and kind of we establish that we're both looking at the same table or we're both looking at the same tree instead of me thinking we're speaking about a circle and them thinking we're speaking about a square. We both agreed that we're talking about a square and then we left the conversation there and we didn't actually commit to anything. And so here, this level of, of saying we, we need to wrap it up and understand that we've committed to each other to achieve something on this specific subject we started the conversation on is an immensely useful tool when we want to achieve results and we have an end in mind of where we want to go. So with this in mind, just because we know we've just introduced the team uh, and all the participants to the model, John, could you take us through one more time these four different steps perhaps even playing a little bit with the depth, because you spoke about the foreground of the model on the right there. What, what's that bit in the background and how does that relate to the four steps we see there, the four uh, parts on the left that we see detailed? Uh, which four parts, Sebastian, are you talking about? Well, the, the recognize and suspend. Okay, got it. All right, so real is an acronym for four particular skills. So not only do we want to use the process in difficult conversations, initiate, discover, connect, and build, but in the course of the training, people will learn how to recognize and suspend their, their thinking. So we all make assumptions about people in certain situations. Um, and one of the things participants will learn is they can't do that. They have to realize that they need to be open to what the person may be saying. And so there are skills around recognizing and suspending. Expressing is just what I'm doing now, but how do we express ourselves in such a way that we allow people to hear our message? So there are certain skills about uh, expression that allows us to talk in such a way that people can understand. Obviously asking is doing nothing more than asking questions. And there are skills around asking questions. In fact, you can marry express with ask. So if I said to you, I'm hoping I've been clear and I'm looking at the person and they don't say anything, I got to follow with the question, have I? And they go, well, yeah, 
Well, I wouldn't buy that at all. Because my next question is going to be, I, and maybe I'll say, I noticed that you just hesitated a little bit, which leads me to think that maybe there's some things that I just said that weren't particularly clear. Tell me where I need to be more clear. What do I need to explain again? Help me understand what I can do to make sure that we're both on the same page. And then listening and attending. I, I put that in there not because there's recognize and suspend on the other end of the axis, but because we often listen or hear, but we don't attend. And, and when we talk about attention, we're really talking about being present with the person. And that becomes so critical because quite frankly, people are often sending us messages that we don't recognize that we miss. And when we miss those messages, then we have to admit to ourselves that there's something that they're telling us with their behavior, with their nonverbals, with their tone of voice, with the words that they're using and choosing that tell us that we're missing part of the message. So these are four different skill areas where people will learn a number of different tactics that will help them be a better communicator as they use the model, initiate, discover, connect, and build. Does that make sense? Oh, John, clear as day for me. We'll hear from the group because now uh, is the moment when we're saying, would you join us in practicing this form of conversational Kung Fu? Get and understand what real talk is. If there are any questions that have come up during John's explanations, during this presentation in general, now's the time to share them. Feel free to use the chat or the Q&A section. I've seen that we've been collecting a few questions there. Uh, now and we'll take a few minutes because we're wrapping up the webinar now just to see if we can uh, support any of the unknowns or questions that our listeners have developed over the past 30 minutes all right so we have one question from cecilia uh, from the q a box John, what happens if someone gets overly emotional? Well, one of the things we talk about in um, listening and attending is the fact that emotion is a symbol of a violated value. And so when people become emotional, what they're really doing is telling you that something either you said or you did that was important to them was maybe overlooked or rejected. And so people learn to listen in a different way. Uh, so a particular skill would be the reflecting skill that we teach in, in the asking section. So I might say to someone, I notice that you're starting to be a little upset. Tell me what that's all about. Because people learn that emotion is the mask of meaning. And what I mean by that is the emotion is what we see but we really don't know what's behind it. And so when we acknowledge what we're seeing by making a reflecting statement, I can see you're upset. And then I ask for the meaning, what's going on? Then that puts us in a position to basically understand what is the meaning behind that emotion so then we can address it. So the more questions we ask, the better, because quite frankly, when people start to get emotional, and I'm not talking about joy, happiness, I'm talking about anger, frustration, they're in a place in their brain, quite frankly, where they're not thinking. So if they have enough presence of mind to answer the questions that I'm asking them, it pushes them literally physiologically out of what we call their amygdala into their neocortex, where they have to be more rational. And that restores, if you will, the rationality that may be missing in the moment. I hope that helps. Let us know if it did. Thank you, John. I'm sure Cecilia appreciates it. We've got two more questions about how do we get the other party to know that to use the model without them knowing? And then also how and where can we apply the real conversation? Now, we've, we are at the end of the moment. So I just like to say to uh, both and Mauricio and James, we do have a very well planned out and designed workshop. It's either two days face-to-face, -face, several different virtual sessions. We also have a self-paced option. 
So we go into depth with the principles that John had mentioned earlier, how to use the model expertly uh, and become a true master of the model. So I'd like, a, oh, I'm happy to see Mariana's comment. Elisa's back. Team, if you enjoyed this conversation and would like to learn more about how we apply this, I'll just leave this thank you with our QR code and my LinkedIn. Um, but if as participants, you'd like to continue and we can discuss uh, these points that have been brought up in the chat, we're happy to be here for everyone that is on a tight schedule. Thank you for attending uh, and hope to see you in one of our other webinars. Thank you, John. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, everybody. And so with that said, we do have a few questions. Some people are dropping off, but uh, I, I will start with uh, Mariana's comment, very useful method to apply in any situation in everyday life. The key is to connect with others and listen in order to really talk and not just deliver the message. Oh, great. Some, uh, some thankful messages. And There's a question from Tobias just about Mariana. You may want to look into that one. Wonderful. The discussion is more on problem identification, analysis, and solutions, but if goals are not directly or similarly clear to the participants or team. So John, I think this has to do with the, the importance of initiation and aspects of that uh, element of the model. One of the things we didn't talk about in our session is there's two steps that um, preclude the actual stating of anything in initiation. The first one is for a person to say to themselves, what is it that I'm assuming about this person in this situation? So if I said to myself, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that this person um, doesn't understand what I asked them to do, and I'm really upset about it, just to be able to recognize that for myself, that I'm emotional, should help me to recognize that I can't be emotional when I hold this conversation, because if I am, that's going to color the tenor of the entire conversation. So it kind of is a way of me taking a, a fresh look, or if you want, even a chill pill on myself first. And the second step is to identify my intention. What is, I, what is it that I want to have to take place from this conversation? So you have to notice that if, if there's a problem between you and another person, they obviously didn't understand, if that makes sense. Um, and then you, that might be the basis of how I initiate. Just from the standpoint, you know, I, I'm noticing that uh, I'm thinking that maybe there was a problem with the way I kind of explained what I needed. Can we talk about that? Now I go, well, yeah, that's I'd love to talk about that. So here are the here's the data. You know, I said X, Y, Z, and yet I got A, B, C. And that leads me to think that there was some part of what I said that where there was a misunderstanding on my part or even your part. So share with me, what, what, what happened? Let, tell me what's going on. And so notice I identified, I, I tried to get them engaged in the situation and, and I acknowledged that there was, must some, there was some kind of misunderstanding between analysis and maybe what was actually attempted to be accomplished. And I'm off to the races by asking as many questions as I can to make sure that I've understood. When I think I've got it all, I summarize that. And then I ask them, did I get it all? And if they go, well, yeah, but yeah, you missed this. Well, tell me more about this. So that allows me to go back to discovery and fill out what it is that I think I need to understand before we even move to the build part. Um, so when there's a disconnect on results, that tells us that either they didn't understand because they interpreted in a certain way, or maybe I wasn't clear in what it is that I said. And so that's what we need to kind of ferret out and understand before we build a solution. Does that make sense? If you could respond to that, that would be very helpful. I'm looking at the I believe chat. So Tobias is still, is still with us. But I do know we are, are wrapping up in some great uh, comments from our team. Oh, Tobias confirms. So John, hit, hit the nail Got on the head. It. And 
I'd like to, again, thank everyone that has attended. Uh, Kostas, let's stay in touch. Uh, some great comments and questions from Greece. But team and John, thank you, especially after a July 4 celebration yesterday for, for getting up early. I know the time difference is challenging, uh, but we appreciate it, as do our global audience. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. I hope that was helpful for everyone. I believe it was. All right. We'll be closing the session. We'll see you in the next webinar. Bye bye, everyone. Let's start with.